conditions. Um, so when you got into the part talking about the Trinity, you know, a lot of you were, you know, trying to prove the Trinity and do this kind of thing. Always remember to kind of approach it the same way you do with your Christology. It's not a matter of trying to prove it with logic as much as simply this is what's been revealed. And, you know, a few of you said it that way, you know, we believe it because that's what, what, what Jesus said or that's what was revealed. And that's what the best way to approach that. Um, keep in mind, when you're talking about the Trinity, uh, I have this personal kind of thing that really always bugs me, and that's when people use the word part with God. Um, God doesn't have parts, okay? So we don't have Jesus part, Holy Spirit part, Father part. And so to say that Jesus is part of God, uh, not the best. That, that you start getting the idea of kind of, you know, the you know, kind of pulling apart the Trinity. And we're going to talk about that today, actually, because um, it's stuff that comes up with chemists. Um, God is not a uh, sum of parts. God just is God, and he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He doesn't have parts. God's simple. Remember that term from Systems 1? No, you don't. You just give me that look. The, the simplicity of God, remember that? Uh, we talk about God's simplicity, which doesn't mean God's not complicated, but it kind of does. It doesn't mean that he's easy to figure out, and that's not true. But the simplicity of God means he's not the sum of his parts. He's not like an iPod that you can take apart into all of its constituent pieces. He's not like a car that you can take apart and say, there, that's the whole thing is, is God. God's just God, simple. And so he doesn't have parts. So don't use the word part when you're talking about God. Um, second thing to be careful about is um, when you're arguing for why Jesus had to be God, the temptation, and this is part of our heritage, and a lot of us, you know, before this class, I'm willing to bet most of you probably would have done something like, well, he has to be God because if he wasn't God, when he died for us, we wouldn't be saved. And he has to be man so he can, you know, bridge the gap. And, you know, you get, these arguments have their place, but this is what I used to call the um, logic of salvation kind of argument. And some of you will have that on your paper, you know, be careful of the logic of salvation. Um, this is not the strongest argument to make because then we're essentially making rational arguments. Well, it had to be this way, and God had to make Jesus human and man because that was the only way to save us. Well, you know, come on. This is, uh, it's which was revealed, that's fine, but to make this like the, the basis of your argument is not the best. The best place to make your argument then, as most of you have figured out, is simply from the economy of salvation. This is what happened. And some of you said it really clearly. You know, why do we say Jesus is God? Because he showed himself to be God. We don't have any choice. So it's not a matter of, you know, we wanted to believe it or it fits our theology or, you know, we, we think it's nice if he's God. It's a matter of, this is what he did. And so why do we confess from God? Because he did God's stuff, period. And so what you would want to do in your paper, really, is just kind of pound home the economy of salvation. And when I talk about the economy of salvation, I'm talking about the plan that was actually carried out, what God did in Christ, what Jesus did. And when Jesus is running around doing God's stuff, forgiving sins, stopping storms, um, raising the dead, uh, teaching with authority, uh, receiving worship, huh, I guess he's God. Exactly, exactly. And that's really the best way to make your argument. So those are some of the comments I'll make just in general. Um, any questions you have in particular or specifics then regarding your paper, thinking back to what you wrote and what I've just been saying? <clears throat> you can check it out for yourself when you actually see your grade and see what you think. If you ever reading, are reading your paper and you can't read something I wrote and you don't know what I said, come and ask because I can always read my own writing. And... Um, I'll be happy to talk to you about what it is, and I will not feel the least bit of offense at the fact that you can't decipher my handwriting. That will be no problem. So come and ask me if you're not sure about what I wrote. And if you don't understand what I wrote, by all means, come and ask, and I'll try to clarify that as well. I, I usually have a whole lot more I could say about a paper, but I don't want to spend hours writing all kinds of comments. And so if you want to come and talk to me about a paper, I'd be happy to do that, and I can tell you more about what I think of your paper in a free-flowing conversation. <laughs> all right. Good. Anything else? All right, excellent. Today, um, well, any questions in general as we get started today? Because today we um, launch in a moment into um, cabinets. But any questions before we get into that? Anything from previous? Last time we had our tour de force through Peeper, and it was a tour de force. Um, so any questions or any lingering issues that you're still kind of um, wondering about or any loose ends that need to be um, tied up? in your thinking so that we can move forward. Okay, seeing none. All right, so today you read Chemnitz. What would you think? 
Yeah. Well, uh, first part was really hard to just get through. Yeah. 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 Then, it, then it got a lot better and easier. All right. Fair enough. Cabinet starts where we don't want them to start. Definitions. And then the worst part is these are heavily philosophically freighted definitions. And he assumes a whole lot of understanding on your part about kind of basic Platonism and basic Aristotelianism. And in his day, every theologian had that foundation. Nowadays, you don't. And so it makes it a little bit tough sledding initially. But you're right, it gets better. OK, that's true. Other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, the last two pages you had us read for today, I thought were, were really well written and a really good summary of what he said, and really useful for preaching and teaching as well. OK. I would agree. The, um, useful, practical. Wow. More on that before we're done here. What a concept. All right. Good. Other initial thoughts? Just having cranked through chemnets. Maybe your first go around with chemnets. Any initial reactions or thoughts? Yeah. I know they were shaded differently, but it seemed to say the same thing. Just same response to all the different mm -hmm. heresies. And Granted, they were shaded towards the heresy, sure. getting at the main idea he was. But that, that, that's a fair observation, I think, Daniel. I mean, you know, truth is truth, and you can only say it so many ways, I guess. And if you're going to, you know, respond to a heretic, you give him the truth. And so yeah, that's probably true. All right. Yep. Um, maybe this is just more me, um, but he talked, he made a lot of proofs uh, that, like, Jesus died for, or took on sin. Mm by using Isaiah, mm -hmm. and I just thought it was, I thought that's an interesting move to take the Old Testament to prove what Jesus did, and I know we say, you know, the whole canon. And right, right. You mean he's treating it almost like a fifth gospel, right. like an eyewitness account. Yeah, that is, you're right. Yeah, he's just very comfortable doing that, and no one would have disputed it in his time, so that's very interesting. Good observation. All right. Anything else on cabinets? Yeah. Uh, he concentrates in Greek almost entirely, whereas, you know, you know, we get Hebrew or, or uh, Latin out of, uh, out of any of the prior readings, I guess. Yeah, Chemnitz, Chemnitz is using his Greek a lot, and a lot of this is because he's using the church fathers who are doing stuff in Greek, and he's dealing with New Testament stuff. And so, yeah, he, he's definitely knowing his Greek and using it pretty freely. That's quite true. Part of it's also because of the, the nature of the translation. The translation determined not to go ahead and translate the Greek, but to leave the Greek in. And so you, you see it more, and it maybe stands out to you more. So yeah, you're right. It's there. Chemnitz definitely knows his languages. It just seems a little odd, maybe, from his time and place. Yeah. Uh, why do you say that? What makes you think it's odd? Well, I think the, you know, the early church always stuck more with Latin. It depends entirely on where you are. If you're in the West, yeah, you'll get the Latin stuff. If you're in the East, you're going to get Greek like crazy. And so it really depends on which church father you're quoting. If he's an Eastern father, it's going to be in Greek. And it was only, only the Western guys um, who were writing in, in Latin. So you got Cyril, that's all Greek. And you got um, you know, the other guys, you know, anybody else from the East, it's going to be in Greek. That was just the way they did it. And that led to some rather protracted arguments between the two of them, too, on occasion. All right, good. Anything else? Yeah, but um, speaking on that, I, I know you quoted a lot of Greek fathers, you know, which yes. uh, Lutherans tend to not really do. Really. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah, he used the fathers freely, and a lot of Greek fathers, and um, he uses them whenever they suit his purpose, and he's not afraid to use them. Quite right. The, there's an important point that. Um, He's using the tradition, and he's using it in an authoritative way. He's not afraid to do it. And he, he's going back and looking where things were wrong in the tradition, what was right. But what is interesting is um, this, and this is something that hopefully you're catching on to by now. And it's going to get reinforced again next quarter when we do Systems 3. But, you know, our, our mantra of, you know, Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone, you know, the, the soul is three or maybe four, depending on where you want to look at it. Um, scripture alone... I think it's trotted out but used very poorly because we don't believe Scripture stands by itself, right? And Chemnitz is evidence of this. Scripture needs to be read a certain way in the context of what we've been given, what you might call the regular fide or the analogy of faith. In other words, we read it according to what the church has given us, and that's what's going on here, and that's why the fathers matter. Now, people get nervous. They say, whoa, 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 whoa. we're not Roman Catholic. You know, tradition isn't norm us. 
And in reaction to that, I'd say, all right, tradition is not on an equal footing with Scripture, but neither do we diss tradition. And there's been a move probably in our own church body, and you know, more recently, to kind of pull away from tradition too much and kind of act like, hey, just read the Bible and you come up with this stuff, which is simply not true. And your assignment really illustrates this. Um, who else is reading the Bible? And Jehovah's Witnesses read the Bible, but they completely ignore all that has been given us and think they know better and then came up with all their wrong, goofy ideas. And so simply reading the Bible is not the ticket. You need to read the Bible a certain way. And Chemnitz teaches us this and reminds us of this. There is a place for what has gone before. There's a place for the wisdom of the fathers or the church or whatever you want to call it. And it's not just a matter of this father said, therefore, but it's a matter of this father said it in the context of what the church has given us and this is how we have learned to read and we can learn to read with confidence because it's in the light of the analogy of faith, the regular fide. Good. Was Chemnitz what you expected? Any surprises? Any disappointments? Okay. No big surprises. Sometimes people get kind of perplexed because, you know, or a little bit mildly surprised at how accessible this is. And maybe that will become more evident to you as you go along. Um, the initial part's pretty, pretty tough sledding. I'll, I'll grant you that. But as you start to make your way and follow Chemnitz, you realize it's pretty laid out. It's pretty reasonable, and it's pretty much bing, 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 what you would expect. And it's not that um, put-offish, even though this is kind of something like the best of theology. You know, when you get into real heavy-duty theology, Chemnitz is it. And so when you can handle this, you should feel like, well, I'm doing something, which you are. And so that's kind of cool. All right. Did you read the introductory stuff? What do you know about Chemnitz? And then you know, now what's going to happen, I'm going to chastise you for not reading the introductory stuff. You are not assigned it. So that means, go oh, good, I don't have to bother with it. Wrong. Anytime you pick up a book for the first time and you're going to launch into that book, Take the time to read the introductory stuff. Take the time to say, all right, what do I need to know to kind of get started here? So read the preface, read the introduction, at least skim through it and get an idea of what's going on. It doesn't take that long to do it. Uh, I, I've heard this before, and I guess I'll reiterate it here. I didn't read through it all, but the uh, fact that if Chemnitz hadn't arrived, then Luther's theology would have died off. Yeah. There, there's a ton of truth to this. Now, interesting, we'll get to that. Who, tr who um, wrote the introduction for this volume? Preuss. J.A.O. Preuss. You remember him from your history courses. That's the Preuss who was running the show when the whole walkout thing was going on. That kind of becomes his reputation. But it's interesting to recognize he was no slouch as a scholar. In fact, he knew what he was doing. He's the one who, gave, who translated the whole volume of this, and he was quite a scholar and quite a theologian, not just a politician, or probably not even a politician, really. He was a scholar and was thrust into the position. So this is, this is that price. Um, so he translated, he wrote the introduction, and he asserts, which has been said by others, that Chemnitz was crucial for the success of the teaching of the Reformation. The, sometimes he's called the second Martin. And of course, he's functioning in what we would call the second generation or the next generation of the Reformation in the late 16th century rather than the early 16th century. So Luther's doing his thing early 16th century, and the Chemnitz is at the end of that century. And Chemnitz is going full tilt, doing his thing. And not only is he writing books like The Two Natures of Christ and The Examination of the Council of Trent, but he's also one of the chief guys behind the Formula of Concord, as you know from your Confessions II course. That's the same guy, that Chemnitz. And so he's rather critical for the success of the teaching because he helped to solve a lot of the dissension that was going on. We had the church starting to fracture into all kinds of weird things and some things very wrong. And so Chemnitz pulled things back together with the help of some of the other formulators and got things back on track and essentially salvaged or, or um, sustained and, and secured the, 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 the teaching of the Reformation. So that's to his credit. Anything else stand out to you if you read the introduction? One of the little weird things, and it's kind of really interesting, which will really throw people, is the fact that his first great love was actually astronomy. Loved astronomy. And then came to theology later. Um, he, had a, he did a gig as a librarian for a couple of years, and that's where he just read voraciously to the church fathers. And the, the memory of these guys is remarkable, because he could remember the stuff he read and dig it out and put it into his text later. So it's like it's pretty impressive. And remember, he did this without Google searches. Um, he just knew where to find stuff. Pretty impressive. 
Um, but he loved astronomy. And in fact, one of his jobs that he had for a while, he was being paid by a prince, and the prince expected him every once in a while to um, cast a horoscope for him. And he would do this kind of thing. And that usually raises the eyebrows of most good Christians, evangelicals, like, oh, horoscopes. Chemnitz, he's a devil worshiper, you know? And we get all freaked out by this. And we need to remember that in the Middle Ages and through the Reformation period, people saw astronomy and even astrology much differently than we do now because they recognized God as the one behind everything. And so if God is the one behind everything and he puts the stars in their order and directs us the courses of the stars, will the stars reveal his truth? Of course. Of course. And so if you have wisdom and can figure things out, you can see what's going on in the stars and see what they're telling us. I mean, this is a kind of a key part of the Christmas story. We're here at Epiphany, right? So what, the, what's what got the magi to the Holy Land was what's, what was going on in the sky. It was the stars because they had the same conviction. The stars reveal truth, and if we pay attention, we'll find some things out. And so maybe we as Christians shouldn't be quite so, you know, negative toward casting, you know, toward horoscopes. Not that you go home and do Christian horoscopes, but we need to have maybe a little bit more patience with seeing how they, how they understood this. And I'm, I'm not advocating you start, you know, reading yours or believing God's going to speak truth through that kind of thing. However, they did have a different way of looking at it in, the, in earlier times, which is kind of interesting. All right, anything else, just by background here? All right, one more thing to cover, and then we'll launch into the details and start getting to actually what Chemnitz is doing. Chemnitz, his whole book here is actually a really good demonstration of rhetoric. <coughs> and I believe I've talked about this in here before, right? The idea of rhetoric and what it means. Have I done that? Yes, yes, okay. Chemnitz really illustrates this very nicely. Remember, rhetoric is nothing more than the power of persuasive speech, the effort to try to bring somebody around to your way of looking at things. And rhetoric is a skill and an art, and it's something you practice and you learn, and you, are, you become more proficient at it. That's rhetoric. Chemnitz illustrates this beautifully in the very um, structure of the two natures of Christ. This is good rhetoric going on here, and you'll see lots of examples of it. Like, for example, when he makes a list of things, how often does he have seven for his list? You know, he'll have two lists of seven. It's like, hmm, wonder why seven? Well, because seven's a powerful rhetorical number. He likes it. And so he's got this kind of parallelism, and he'll balance things out. And you, like you said, even the arguments seem to sound kind of redundant. Well, that's part of rhetoric, too. You say the truth again and again and again. That's part of the rhetorical force of it. So there's lots of that going on in here. And who would have taught him his rhetoric? Yes, Philip, of course. Philip Melanchthon, the teacher of rhetoric. And it's interesting that even through the second generation of the Reformation, when all these battles were going on, each of the different sides were using the tools taught by the same person, because they were all taught at Wittenberg by Philip. And they were all using his tools very effectively in communicating their message across. And that's exactly what Kenneth is doing as well. So these guys had a great respect for Philip and followed what he taught them, even if they were disagreeing with some of his points. And that's kind of interesting also. All right. Now, having said all that, let's get into this. Before we get too far in, one other thing I didn't have you read was this dedicatory epistle where Chemnitz is laying out, thanks for having me write this, and I'm going to dedicate this epistle to one of my princes who are helping to fund me, basically. And he makes an interesting reference on page 18. Right in the middle of the page, he writes this. For the sake of brevity, I shall pass over a large number of other ideas. For the mystery of the person of Christ was a sign of contradiction and a stone of stumbling to some of the greatest minds. For the devil, who is fully aware of how important it is for the salvation of men that the truth of this doctrine continue in the church in all the simplicity with which it is taught in Scripture, causes frivolous and ambitious minds to inject into this discussion foreign and wicked ideas conform to the judgment of reason, that the simple purity of this mystery may be adulterated. The chief cause of these lapses is that the curiosity of the human mind hates to limit itself to the bounds of divine revelation and to be forced within such narrow confines. For it either longs to wander beyond these well-marked boundaries and to seek and investigate more than is revealed in the word, or it takes to itself opinions agreeable to reason and then tries to twist and turn also the teachings of Scripture regarding this mystery to conform to these preconceived notions. That's pretty significant. Now, a couple of interesting things there. First of all, what does Chemnitz argue about the teaching of Christology as he's going to present it? Is it complicated or pretty simple? Simple. And you're thinking, come on, why does it take you 500 pages? 
Yeah, exactly. Well, that's also part of the rhetorical force. Absolutely comprehensive. He's going to leave no stone unturned. And by the time you get to the end of your 500 pages, you're pretty much ready to say, I think he covered it all. I can't think of one thing left out. And that's his whole point. He wants to be absolutely comprehensive. That's part of the force of his argument. But he makes the contention, it's just pretty simple. It's not complicated. And we're going to see this kind of coming through, actually, in spite of all the, po the stuff in here. You always have this basic thing. You've got the human nature and the divine nature both coming together in the person of Christ. And it's really just that simple. It's just that simple. Now, this has all kinds of implications and interesting um, inf inf impl um, influences coming into play here. And we think it through and we kind of trace some things out. But this is always going to be the bottom line. The full human nature, the full divine nature, completely present in Christ. That's it. This is what we confess. And the hypostatic union, the personal union, however you want to call it. It's a simple thing. All right, that's the first thing he says, which is noteworthy. The second thing is, what does he attribute as the cause for most of the problems when it comes to Christological heresies? The devil, the devil manifests where? In human reason, the human mind. The, the mind, the human reason, is not content to limit itself to the revelation of God, but wants to figure things out in an orderly, logical way, or in something that's reasonable, or comes to the conclusion and say, it must be this way, therefore, and then imposes that on Scripture. This is the problem with just about every heresy down the line. And we see this showing up again and again and again. And that's why the question about what is the place of reason in the theological task is never minor or insignificant. It is a, it's a crucial question. And whether we have a ministerial use of reason or a magisterial use of reason is really significant. It matters a lot. We need to learn to let reason be submissive to Scripture and submissive to what God has revealed and not trying to lord it over. And we see Chemnitz himself actually following this often. Did you notice how many times even in today's reading he'll just kind of back off and say, hey, we can't figure this out. We just got to leave this alone. And he even makes references sometimes to the heavenly school. Catch that? What's he mean by that? What he basically means is, what's that? Yeah, God's wisdom, or even better, you know, this is stuff that this side of eternity we'll never figure out. When we get to the eschaton, then maybe we can get it figured out. It's kind of the old thing you tell your kids. You can ask Jesus someday. And you ask God about that. And we kind of laugh. But that's essentially what Chemnitz is doing. You know, you want an answer to that one? Yeah, you know, go ask God about it someday. Because we don't have one. And there isn't one to give. But if you try to provide answers for everything and press and lean heavily on human reason, Chemnitz argues you're going to end up in heresy and end up in error. And that's the point he makes. And I, I am completely sympathetic to that and would agree with him. All right, so having said all that, now we finally arrive at page 29, the beginning of your reading. Um, I'm going to crank through everything between here and page 159 that I think is important, even if you didn't have to read it. And the, um, the reading assignment we give, we established here, is meant to make it possible for you to read the guts the important stuff without having to read everything. And usually the stuff we kind of skip over is usually when he starts quoting church fathers. Not always and only, but usually. And so that's kind of what's going on. But there are some things that he talks about, I think, on occasion beyond what you're required to read, which I think are important. So I'm going to highlight those for you as well. All right. So he's going to start with definitions. And his key definitions are focused around, especially, the understanding of person. This is a biggie. What do we mean by person? How do we define person? And when you start reading this chapter, it becomes evident to you that, you know, this is why we have philosophers, because this is harder than it looks. You think, oh, I know what a person is. Well, define it. And when you start actually trying to, put, to define it in a way that's going to be useful and be accurate, it gets kind of tough. And it gets tough pretty quickly. And that's what you have going on here. So Chemnitz kind of wrestles through this a little bit, and then he begins finally to offer a definition on page 29, to about eight lines up. For the term person, maybe 10, as it is usually defined as an individual, intelligent, incommunicable substance which is not part of something else, is not sustained by something else, and does not depend on something else. So there's his neat definition of person. He's trying to come to a, a term, an understanding of person. And the emphasis here is on the um, individualization, the self-sustaining, not bound into something else. We have this kind of instantiation 
of an individual. That's the, the real emphasis here. So that's the idea of person. Um, person is our English word. The Greek would be hypostasis. Okay, a hypostasis, which you think about stasis coming from the word to stand and then to stand over or under, so it's kind of like standing by yourself, hypostasis. And then the Latin, of course, is persona. That's pretty easy. But these are synonyms. So hypostasis and persona are really synonyms of this idea of person. So whether it's Latin or Greek, hypostasis or persona, you're getting, we're getting at the same thing. Uh, individualized self-existing substance, person. All right, now this is in contrast to another key word in this chapter, which is essence. Essence or substance or ousia, okay? Or sometimes a hypostasis, which makes things really confusing because sometimes these words get to use almost interchangeably and inside that doesn't help very much. But he is making a, con a distinction between a person and essence. And this is useful because we would make the same kind of thing. And this gets a little bit into some Greek thinking here, but we need to run through this real quickly. The essence is what makes something what it is. It's isness. And that's where we get the idea of the ousia of something. It's isness. Just the way it is, the isness of something. So that's the essence. Um, everyone in this room is human. So that means we all share in the isness of humanity. Right? So that means we have human characteristics. So with the essence of something, there are certain characteristics that go with that essence. And these characteristics can be essential or they can be accidental. And more on that in just a minute as far as the accidents of something. So the isness is what makes something what it is. So what makes a human a human is, well, a biped with um, two eyes, with an ability to have rational thoughts, um, mammal, whatever. You start making your list of things that make a human a human. And again, that gets a little more complicated. If you've ever had a philosophy course where you had the discussion about what makes a cat a cat, so then if you cut off the tail, is it still a cat? Cut off a leg, is it still a cat? Another leg, is it still a cat? And you just keep on lopping off parts. Then eventually you ask the question, when does it stop being a cat and become something else? You know, these are these kind of philosophical discussions you, you get into. So what makes a human a human? Well, we would say it's the essence, the substance of humanity. So we all share in the essence of humanity, but we're not all the same. And so we are all individual persons who share in the essence of humanity. So that's how it works with people and with human beings. God's different. God's different. Because God, by definition, is unique and singular. God is one. That's why, for God, the reality of God's essence and his substance and his instantiation is all one. And that's what I'm trying to get at with the idea of the simplicity of God. God's not the sum of his parts. God doesn't have parts. God just is God. And this even is kind of interestingly illustrated by that famous small catechism illustration that you all remember. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have the lines drawn. And we have the word is not, is not, and is not. Remember this one? And in the middle, what's in the middle? circle called God, and we have lines going to that, and we have the word is, is, is. Remember that illustration? Pretty famous, small catechism. Not good. Why not? What's wrong with it? It looks like there are these three different parts, and in fact, it looks like there's a fourth thing called God, and all three parts participate in it. So we've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit, add them up, now you get God, a new, the fourth thing. No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. There is no fourth thing called God. And this is also one of the weaknesses of some of our Trinitarian hymns, where you've got a Father verse, and a Son verse, and a Holy Spirit verse, and then we have a nice culminating fourth verse where the organ pulls out of the stops and puts on a little Dinkelheimer that goes, and, and what do we have here? We have a Trinitarian verse. And I know there's a name for that stop, but I don't remember what it is. Um, and so we have the Trinitarian verse. Oh, Trinity, we sing to you. Well, in fact, there is no such thing as Trinity. 
There's not a fourth thing called the Trinity, which is the summation of the other three. There's simply Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God. That's God. There is no fourth thing. I know this is kind of dense, but this is the idea of the simplicity of God. So God's not some of his parts. So God doesn't have like, there's not a God thing, and then we decide, does the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit fit into that? Yep, okay. And now we, so we have this kind of ultimate definition, which is God apart from the three. No, 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 no. There is simply Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's God. What they are is God. They define God. There's no God thing apart from that, which is also why um, some people take shots at Aquinas because he talks about God and Trinity as two separate articles, when if we would say, no, it's just all one discussion. Can't pull them apart. With me here? All right, Gary. Then can we say that, that Trinity is a word that describes describes God, but it isn't God. Trinity is simply a useful tool, a term we use, to describe the way that God is three in one. And we use the word Trinity to get at that, to describe that. But in fact, yeah, it's just the word that we've, we've, we've imported. And, and to, as a handy kind of um, reference tool for that reality. Yep. All right. So the definition's in. Person, we've got this individual intelligent thing, and we've got the attributes of the substance, these properties, these characteristics, or these, in Greek, idiomata that go with this. And so the idiomata are there as characteristics of the essence and the substance. And then the accidents are added in. So all of us in this room have the substance of humanity, and we have different accidents, like whether or not you have hair on your head. Um, or whether or not you have brown hair or light-colored hair, or whether or not you wear glasses or don't, or the level of intelligence you have, or whatever the different you know, idiomata might be. All the different accidents that make us the unique individual that we are. Those are the things we are, and yet also we have the characteristics of the idiomata of humanity, like being mortal and these kinds of things. But the interesting question is, what are the essential? What are the accidental? And this is somewhat significant, especially when it comes to our Christology, especially on the question about sinfulness. And this gets back to Formula of Concord, Article 2. Is sin essential to human nature? The answer is no. No. And people get thrown by that. Well, yeah, we're inherently sinful. No, 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 we're not inherently sinful. We are sinful by nature because we've inherited it from those who've come before us, but it's not essential to the human nature because if it was, then if Jesus is going to be fully human, he would have to be sinful, but he's not. And so, in fact, sinfulness is an accident that messes up the true nature of humanity, and that really means that every single human being that we encounter is flawed and is, in some sense, inhuman. And the only truly, fully human person who's ever walked this earth is... Jesus Christ. Amen. Adam for a while. Yeah, for maybe a day or two if you follow Luther. All right. Okay, good. Now, one other thing before we leave this behind, because we don't want to get too bogged down on this, it's interesting also on page 33, just as a passing note, about 12 lines from the bottom of the page, that Chemnitz makes a comment here about the use of scholastic terminology. Because he readily admits that a lot of the language he's using and the terminology and the vocabulary comes from a scholasticism. All right, let's just make sure we understand. What do we mean by scholasticism? Who are these scholastics? What do we mean by this? Well, Aquinas is kind of usually considered the father of the scholastics. But the scholastics are nothing more, is nothing more than the term that Luther especially liked to use, and there were others who would use it too, but these are the guys who were doing the heavy-duty theology at the time of the end of the Middle Ages, who were trying to figure all these kind of details out, all this minutia theology, and Luther sometimes gets translated as calling them the schoolmen. Same means the same thing. The schoolmen, the scholastics, these are the guys who are trying to figure out things beyond what they should figure out. And often using human ingenuity and human reason and logic to try to provide answers they don't need to provide. Classic example, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? They actually would seriously pursue this. It was not just kind of a something for the fun of it or ha ha ha, who cares? No, they would actually try to pursue an answer, thinking that they could and they needed to. That's an example of scholasticism. Um, Aquinas sometimes gets labeled with that, whether that's fitting or not. You can debate that another time with Aquinas people. But this is what we mean by scholastics. And so the scholastics were certainly around in Luther's day, were still around in Chemnitz's day, and there were many people who would sit down to read Chemnitz 
or we're listening to chemists and we say, hey, wait a minute, that's scholastic vocabulary. You're arguing like a scholastic. That can't be right. And so what's chemist's response to that? You know, the terms are fine. And if somebody has a definition that is useful, we can use it. And if somebody has a way of arguing that is useful, we can use that too. We don't have to reject the whole vocabulary or the whole way of thinking simply because they come to wrong conclusions. And there's a good lesson here for us today so that we can use academic thinking and use reason in a ministerial sense to serve a greater purpose when it's being kept in submission to God's authority and to Christ's authority without letting it run the show. We don't have to be afraid of it just because sometimes it gets misused or abused. Good lesson here. All right, good. So we talked then about the difference between essential and accidental. We've covered that. Chapter 1, done. Any other questions there? All right, so we're going to just crank through these things. So, chemists are starting where you'd expect. Thick, big treatise on the two natures of Christ. Where are we going to begin? Well, we've got to make sure we get our definition straight. What do we mean by our terms? We're going to start there. Next move is, let's talk about, well, let's talk about the two natures in Christ. All right, let's do that. So the first move is, we'll talk about the divine nature, and that's where we go next. So chapter 2, the divine nature in Christ. Pretty much what we would expect. And what goes on here in this chapter and the next one, and the next one, of course, you know where that's going to go. It's going to be, of course, the human nature. Sure. And so the divine nature of Christ, what Chemnitz does now in this chapter is, he traces through all the ways that the divine nature in Christ have been attacked. So essentially what we have is summary of heresies. And this recapitulates what we did last class period when I went through that quick race through of all the different kinds of heresies or a few of the highlights. He goes into much more detail here and he talks about some of them. So he starts going through the Christological heresies and he groups them in two categories. Those that attack the divine nature of Christ and those that attack the human nature of Christ. Right? So we have three categories in this first chapter, and he's going to list three ways that Christ comes under attack. And the first one he lists is, are the Ebionites, or Serinthius was the name of a guy who did this. And the Serinthius, or the Ebionites, what did they teach? Jesus is just a dude. And then God somehow comes on him and takes over him. And we have here really some version often of adoptionism. Adoptionism is sometimes called a heresy in its own right, but really adoptionism is kind of a, a class of heresy, a type of heresy. Any kind of heresy where you have a guy having God infused into him or taking him over in some way, that's some form of adoptionism, and it shows itself in many different ways. So that's one form here, the Ebionites. So that's the first one, and that's a very old one. And the second one he talks about is Arius. Okay, Arius is going to be next. And this is where we say that, and because the first one says, Jesus is God, is night man, but not really God. Done. I mean, it's just flat out denial of the divinity of Christ. That's what that first one is. Then the second one is to say, well, Jesus is fully man, no doubt, and he's God in some way, kind of. So we're back to the Nicaea thing, Nicaea, where we had the whole Moiousius, like God. And so God like. Sort of like when you buy um, processed cheese food product. Okay? And so it's like cheese. Um, is it really? Well, it's Velveeta, so, well, you know, it's like cheese. Cheese spread. You know, cheese food. Or when you get um, chocolate flavored things, you know, hmm, you know, is it really chocolate? And if you're a chocolate connoisseur, you watch for those kinds of labeling things. You realize there's a big difference. So Arius would say, he's God-like. And, of course, then we have not really God. So that's a problem. Then the third one he talks about here is Sibelius. And Sibelius, it would also, um, he, Sibelius is kind of a, a modalist, basically. And modalism is another one of these kind of um, broad categories, type of Christological heresy. And modalist are essentially saying God's one, and he has different ways of manifesting himself. So he wears his father hat, his son hat, his Holy Spirit hat. So God taking on these different modes. And that would be Sibelianism, who teaches this kind of form of modalism. And again, you have Jesus being less than really God, some form of um, the modalism. And this is where you get into the other side of this, the patripassionism. 
And the Pacha Passionists teach that the Father suffers. Patri, Father, Passion, suffers. The Father suffers because if we have modalism, then the Father is actually doing the suffering, and this has been rejected. This is also one of the reasons why, this is back to Balcom, people struggle and wrestle a little bit with this whole idea of God suffering because traditional doctrine has always said the Father, God, doesn't suffer. He's impassable, can't suffer. And that's been a kind of a hallmark. And this is one of these issues that, frankly, in the church today is increasingly being rethought and wondered about and trying to get a handle on what do we mean by God's impassibility when you've got the Old Testament God clearly experiencing these kinds of things. And either you say those are just merely anthropopathisms, they're not real, or you say maybe we need to rethink what we mean by impassable. And so you've got kind of that topic still happening right now, and that plays in here. All right, so that's really chapter 2, where he goes through this, and then he always asserts the truth in against these heresies. So the first one, how do you refute Ebionites? Well, really easily, Christ insists that he is both God and man. How do you refute the second one? Well, in Christ, God is present with his true essence. And then in the third one, how do we handle this one? We handle this by teaching the scriptural truth that only the Son is incarnate and not the whole Trinity. So these are the answers that come to this one. Anything else in chapter 2 that you're wondering about? Call your attention then to one more thing on page 44, which is quite very interesting. This is um, halfway through the last complete paragraph on page 44. Kemet's writes, We shall not look a priori, so to speak, into the secret counsel of the Trinity, but because the Trinity willed that only the Son of God should become man for us, we shall consider a posteriori what sweet consolations our faith may derive and draw from the fact that the second person of the Trinity, the Word, did become flesh. And we shall follow in the footsteps of Athanasius in his book on the humanity of Christ. All right, there are several things very interesting to point out from this just short quote. He makes a distinction between how are we going to do this work? Are we going to do it a priori or are we going to do it a posteriori? These are terms you should know well beyond the field of theology. They just are even using legalese or even in just basic common language. What does a priori mean? Well, take it apart, Latin scholars. A means from, and prior means before. Literally, from before. A posteriori then would mean from after. It's just that easy. Okay? You see the word prior, you see the word post, figure it out. And you can do this with almost 90% of Latin translation. Just guess your way through. Now, I didn't advocate that, but it can happen. All right, so a priori, a posteriori. Now, what does that mean when it comes to talking about theology and our Christology? A priori versus a posteriori. Anybody want to take a crack at this? What are we distinguishing here? Yeah, Bill. From above and from below. Exactly, exactly. Are we doing our Christology from above or from below? Are we doing it following the economy? Or we're doing it following speculation and logic and reason that we've come to conclusions about. And so that's why he says we're not going to do it a priori, but in fact we're going to do it a posteriori. We're going to do our Christology in the light of what actually happened, in the light of what Jesus actually did. And what we would say is according to the economy of salvation, how it unfolded. And so when we say that only the Son became incarnate, do we do that based on what we know about God? Or do we do that based on what actually happened? based on what happened. And how do we know that he's only the Son? Because the Son says, the Father sent me. Well, it's pretty clear. And you've got the Son praying to the Father. It's pretty clear. There's a distinction here. The Father's not there. The Son is. Now, how that works, who knows? Frankly, who cares? That's just the way it is. And that's essentially what Kevin's is saying. So we come to these conclusions a posteriori. So it's very interesting. He's arguing very much the same way that we have been arguing beforehand, and here's Chemnitz making the same kinds of moves. And this is somewhat surprising, because you would think, if anybody is going to do you know, a Christology from above, oh, that's going to be Chemnitz. But no, he doesn't want to play that game. He wants to very much say, let's see what's going on. Now, there are times when he's going to do some of the from above stuff, but here, clearly it's from below. All right, the other thing that's very really interesting in this quote is when you notice his motivation for doing this work, and what is it? Did you catch this? We shall consider a posteriori, a posteriori, what 
sweet consolations our faith may derive and draw from the fact of Christ's full humanity. What's he mean by that? Sweet consolations? What's he mean? Yeah, the, the grace, the comfort. He means that when you actually study this theology, it has an immediate practical consequence of people feel good. In other words, Chemnitz is assuming, taking for granted, that the reason we do this heavy-duty theology is so that Joe Christian, sitting in the pew, has confidence in his faith and feels good about his salvation and rejoices in who his God is. In other words, there's meant to be a practical, very visceral, concrete consequence of this work. This, guys, you need to learn. You need to learn this lesson very importantly. Because Luther said the same thing, Melanchthon said the same thing, here's Kenneth saying the same thing, and way too often we forget. But theology and practical import go together, always hand in hand. You don't pull them apart. And we have this notion, we do this all the time nowadays in the church. Well, we have theological issues and we have the practical issues. And practical is where we take care of people and we're nice and loving and kind and make sure they feel good. And then theology is where we get all hard-nosed and anal retentive and get really worked up about stuff. And got to be right. And then you have the two camps fighting against each other. Well, you don't care about people. Well, you don't care about theology. And away we go. Chemists would look at that argument and say, what are you guys talking about? I don't get it. And Luther would say, what are you guys talking about? It's ridiculous. You don't pull them apart. If you want to make people feel good, get your theology right. And if you want to get your theology right, it's going to have an immediate consequence and practical application. And if it doesn't, you got your theology wrong. Because when you get it right, there are sweet consolations that are derived from this. It's, it has immediate relevance. It's practical. Theology and practice always, always, always go together. You can't do them in isolation. You can't have theological rectitude and be a jerk in your ministry. You can't. And you can't be a loving evangelical guy and be a theological slouch. It doesn't work. You can pull it off for maybe a year or two, but eventually it's going to start to unravel and erode around you. And the generations that come after you will reap a mess because they won't know what they believe or why, and it's going to create all kinds of problems. And you guys have witnessed some of this happening. You know what I'm talking about. Right? If you don't, I'll give you concrete examples. But I count on you to fill in the blanks. All right, so Chemnitz gets this. There are immediate ramifications that come from good theology. So we, and here's the bottom line, guys. We don't sit around here and try to figure out really good theology so we can prove everybody how smart we are. Or look how right we are. We're right, you're wrong. So? So it has consequences. You get this stuff wrong, what happens? You lose Jesus. Lose Jesus? Well, then what? You lose salvation. Then you lose the assurance of where you stand. Does that matter? I think it does. People being able to go to sleep at night at peace, good Christology fuels that. And you get your Christology wrong, everything starts to crumble. It matters, guys. So if you're still kind of wondering, you know, what's, you're just getting all worked about theology, what does it matter? So Jesus is Jesus. Yeah, that's right, Jesus is Jesus. And you better keep it straight. And if you get it wrong, you're going to lose him. That's why it matters. Chemnitz gets it.